Hello, everybody, and welcome to Endoscopy Talks. I'm Christopher Chamnus with Carl Stortz, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us on behalf of Colorado State University's new Translational Medicine Institute. Today, we are joined by one of the most well-known small animal arthroscopists in the world. Dr. Brian Beal received his DVM at the University of Florida, where he also completed a three-year residency in small animal surgery and then joined the faculty. Dr. Beal has a special interest in arthroscopy, minimally invasive surgery, fracture repair, joint replacement, treatment of arthritis, and pain management. He's a passionate teacher and frequently lectures and teaches wet labs around the world, which I can attest to. Brian became an ACVS founding fellow of minimally invasive orthopedic surgery in 2018. He's also the CEO of Beal's Best and a surgeon at Beal Veterinary Specialists in Victoria, Texas. With that, I will hand it over to Brian. Well, thank, well, you, thank, thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to, be to be here. here. So um, I'm going to be speaking about one of my passions, as you said, um, arthroscopy. And I've been doing arthroscopy, oh gosh, for probably 25 years now. It's amazing how the, the time has flown. But uh, what I want to talk about today is um, how you can use arthroscopy to actually make a difference. Um, how you can use it to improve your patient outcomes and patient comfort. So why arthroscopy? Well, you know, the, the major advantages of arthroscopy are magnification and looking at the joint in a fluid medium. So basically, if you put a scope in, depending on where you position it, it will magnify your image uh, probably 15 to 25 times. So again, you can just kind of think of certain circumstances when you're going in surgically to, to fix something and you've done it for years and you're having difficulty seeing the meniscus for say. But once you put the, the scope in, the meniscus actually looks humongous and you can see much better. And we'll, we'll talk about more of that when we go through. Arthroscopy will allow you to make a more accurate diagnosis. Again, many diagnoses, we just don't even know what's going on until we can get a scope into the joint. And probably the best example of that is the shoulder. And we'll look at some examples uh, shortly. Um, the obvious reason to use arthroscopy is it's less painful, low morbidity. Um, but, you know, as a surgeon, what I really appreciate about arthroscopy is I can be much more precise. I can, you know, really look at the, the, the target tissue under magnification. I can treat it very precisely without damaging adjacent structures. And lastly, we're in the world of evidence-based medicine. And again, trying to jot down a few notes, which you think you see while you're in doing surgery, really doesn't cut it anymore. So with arthroscopy, you can document everything by images and also video. So what are the indications for arthroscopy? Uh, joint evaluation, that's the major indication. And we can evaluate pretty much any joint in the dog and the cat. We can use it for operative procedures, such as fragment removal, we can treat tendons and ligaments. We can treat cartilage damage. And lastly, we can use it for minimally invasive fracture repair. So when we look at arthroscopy, we want to kind of think about how do we get the most from arthroscopy? I think that's very important. So let's just look at a few images here. So these are arthroscopic images. And I don't know about you, but I don't know what I'm looking at. Okay, and that's the key. To really succeed at arthroscopy and get the benefits from it, you have to have a good image. So you can't treat what you can't see. So for instance, you know, we look at these four images here. Now we know exactly what we're looking at. These are all actually images from the stifle, but you can see the structures very, very clear, clearly with high resolution. So that's going to help you make your decision on what to do, and then you can treat. Um, what are the keys to getting this better view? Well, the most obvious thing is having good equipment. And again, it's very tempting to try to get a deal on equipment. Um, you know, what I always recommend is, is buying good equipment, not, not that it can't be used as long as it's all compatible, but certainly I look at, at uh, arthroscopy as a investment that's gonna be around for a long time. And the, the instruments and the equipment that I bought 15 years ago I can still continue to use. So it has a very long life that you can use it for. So buy good equipment 
And the nice thing about buying good equipment from a reputable dealer is you're going to get the good service to help you with it. And they always have great surgical tips. So I recommend buying new and buy from someone you trust. Um, portal location is critical. You want to learn where to push your portals because if you don't get them in the right position, you're not going to have an optimal view. So we want to really concentrate on putting our portals based on the anatomical structures that we can palpate. Shaving. A shaver is a very useful tool. Again, can you do arthroscopy without a shaver? Certainly in some joints you can, but shavers can be used in all joints and I would highly recommend having one because what I see is that people who don't use a shaver don't have one, they really don't get that view that they, they really need to, to do the work that they want to do. They, they just basically try to get along. And so I would very much encourage you to get a shaver. You need to learn to control hemorrhage. And there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, basically, you can use a cautery wand inside the joint. It just has to be insulated to the tip. We can increase our fluid flow or we can decrease our egress. Those are all methods of controlling hemorrhage. But probably the best advice I can give you to control hemorrhage is don't create hemorrhage. So when you're doing your tissue debridement or shaving, just debride a small amount of tissue. You don't need to try to, to remove all the tissue in the joint to get a better view. It's usually just a very small little window of tissue you have to remove. Scope position is important as well. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. You have to know your anatomy. So you should know, once you stick the scope in, if you see a structure, you should probably recognize it. So if you're not sure what it is, learn what the arthroscopic anatomy looks like. And when you're exploring the joint, be systematic. So let's just take a look at a few practical tips using a scope. So we call this driving the scope. So you can see that we've placed the arthroscope into the lateral side of the shoulder joint here. And what I want to show here is the effect of the light post position. In this case, you can see that the light post is facing up. What that means is that your 30 degree lens is looking down. So the lens always looks away from the light post. So in this case here, we would be looking down at the biceps tendon in this case here. Now, if we swing the light post and rotate it around um, the scope, now the 30 degree angle is looking up. So in this case, we would be now looking up at the glenoid and a little bit of the humeral head. So again, we haven't moved the scope necessarily at all. Just by rotating the light cable, you're gonna be able to change your view dramatically. And that's one of the keys. You wanna move your scope as little as possible so you don't inadvertently pull it out of the joint. What about object size and object distance. So let's take a look at this scope here. And this is basically what you're seeing, the viewing angle, okay? And it's, as we said, that's a 30 degree angle. Now, let's say we're looking at this coronoid fragment here. If we have the tip of the scope quite close to the object that we're looking at, this is what it will look like in that case here. Now, if we back the scope away from the target object, you can see what we can see there. So what you can see is when you bring the tip close, it magnifies, but it gives you a smaller field of view. As you move the tip away, it's going to make the target tissue smaller, but now you're gonna get a bigger, bigger field of view. So this is important because you, you generally wanna start with the tip of the scope far away so you can figure out where you are, and then you can advance it towards the target tissue so that it magnifies it and then you can see it more clearly. Triangulation is another thing that, that people struggle with, especially in joints that are very deep, like the shoulder or even sometimes the, um, the, the stifle. Usually the elbow's pretty easy. Now that term, we're not really tr making the scope and the instrument go in at a triangle. We're actually making it go in more as a trapezoid with a little bit of distance between the tip of the scope and the arthroscopic instrument. So you can see here in this diagram how the tip of the scope is a couple millimeters or at least a couple millimeters away from the tip of that, that instrument. So when you look at the image on your left, you can't really see where the tip of the scope and the tip of the instrument in, but what you're trying to do is visualize 
as that instrument goes in, it's not going right to the tip, but it's, it's a slight distance away from that tip as shown on the image on your right. Another practical trip, uh, tip is learn how to do arthroscopic-assisted arthrotomy. This is very, very valuable. Everything that you can see with traditional arthroscopy, you can get the exact same image through a mini arthrotomy. So this is very useful if you're training and you're an inexperienced arth arthroscopist. A lot of times you'll be in there struggling for 30 minutes and, and you won't get too far. So this is an alter alternative. If, if you're struggling and things just aren't going your way, go ahead and open that portal up just a little bit, maybe two centimeters or so. Put a small gelpie in and then just put your scope directly into the joint. Now the fluids, you want to still continue to run those. Those fluids are actually going to spill out of the incision and, and onto the floor or into your pouch. And so it, it gets a bit messy, but when you put the scope in, you're going to get the exact same views that you would get as if you were doing traditional arthroscopy. So we'll use this technique a lot, you know, for inexperienced surgeons or if we're really struggling to get something and we've got maybe swelling outside the joint into the soft tissues, we call that extravasation. Um, we may need to convert to this so that we can get the job done. So I'm gonna stop right there just for a few minutes and let everybody catch up. If there are any early questions, um, we can certainly answer some now. Um, if we don't have any questions, we can move on to the next section. We have a couple. Just a couple of questions. First one is, uh, scopes are obviously coming in different diameters. If I get only one scope to start with arthroscopy, what should the diameter be? You know, that, that really is a great question. And, you know, the, the most versatile scope, in my opinion, is the 2-4 scope. Um, I think you can do elbows with it, you can do shoulders with it, you can do knees, even on big dogs with it. Now, certainly, the bigger the scope you get, the bigger field of view and probably, you know, the bigger scopes will give even better image quality as you get, especially up to the 4.0 scope. But I would say if you only can get one, get a 2.4 scope. Okay, and the other question I have so far um, is a concern about sterility. I worry about infections. Do you use antibiotics? Um, generally, we won't use antibiotics. Um, generally, it's thought that arthroscopic procedures are gonna have a lower chance of infection. When we're doing arthroscopy, the procedure is generally um, a little bit quicker. And so, you know, ordinarily, I don't use prophylactic antibiotics um, in, only in certain circumstances if the surgery is done clean and it's less than an hour and a half. Okay, that's it for now, Brian. One of the reasons why we see decreased um, infections is we have a, a, a really a copious amount of fluids going through the joint. So just that flushing action decreases the chance of any inadvertent contamination. Okay, so now we're gonna get to the fun part. We're gonna actually look at the different joints and we're gonna start with the shoulder. And really arthroscopy has revolutionized what we know with shoulder injuries. You know, basically, basically many years ago, I can remember that so many shoulder injuries were called a sprained shoulder or bicipital tenosynovitis. And what we found was bicipital tenosynovitis is actually very rare. Usually there's an, another problem, which we'll look at in a second. But with shoulder arthroscopy, we've been able to increase our diagnostic capability um, and we can actually tell exactly what is injured. So we use shoulder arthroscopy to evaluate the joint for diagnosis purpose, but we use it to remove fragments, um, OCD for instance, as well as repairing tendons and ligaments in the joint for cartilage treatment, and also we can use it for fracture repair, the most common being a, a uh, supraglenoid uh, tuberosity fracture, where the biceps tendon causes an avulsion fracture at the cranial aspect of the shoulder. So how do you find your scope portal? Well, what I would tell you is it varies from dog to dog. So let's just take a look at the acromion, okay? In the dog on your left, look where the end of the acromion is in relationship to the joint surface and compare that to the dog on your right. So there are anatomical differences. So if you just base your scope portal entry on where that acromion is, 
what you need to do is you need to know what that dog's acromion looks like. Obviously the one on the left, if this is a calibrated image, um, a you know, radiographic calibrated image, we're only gonna introduce that scope about half a centimeter distal to the acromion. But if we tried that on the image on the right, if we introduced that at the same point, we'd be drilling a hole in that glenoid of the scapula. So it's very helpful to look at your radiograph, calibrate it, and measure off the distal aspect of the acromion to the joint surface, and that will give you a hint of where to put your scope in. What about the instrument portal? In the shoulder, it can be quite difficult. So what we're looking at is placing an instrument portal here to help us treat OCD flaps in these two dogs. And you can see based on this, generally we're gonna bring that instrument portal off about 90 degrees from the scapular spine as shown in both instances. And you can see that in one case, we wanna go about two centimeters caudal to the scope portal, which is in blue. And in the image on your right, we wanna go about 2.5 centimeters caudal to the scope portal. So again, looking at your radiograph and trying to plan where you put your portals will make your surgery much easier. Shoulder OCD is by far the most common indication for shoulder arthroscopy. In general, once you become adept at this procedure, you can usually get this flap and treat the bed within about 15 minutes. So it's very quick and very, has, has um, very minimal morbidity. Now, why use a scope? You can certainly go in open, but you're not going to, let's say you go in open and remove this fragment like here on your right in this video. The problem is, is oftentimes there's people, there's pieces that have broken off and go to the front of the joint that you cannot see. The image on your left shows an example of two fragments floating around the biceps tendon. And these fragments can float down the biceps tendon sheath and they can actually grow and attach to the synovium. So we can go in and look at the biceps tendon as shown on the video now, and you can see these big fragments that floated up front that if we had not done arthroscopy, we would have not known that those were up there and those would have been left in the shoulder and this could have led to residual lameness. So arthroscopy lets you look at the entire joint, not just a little area right back by the humeral head. So you can actually see much better in the joint with arthroscopy than you can with arthrotomy. This injury here was really not, was poorly understood. This is a biceps tendon tear. So you can see over here, we have a tear of the biceps tendon, and this was often confused as bicipital tenovitis. It's actually a partial tear of the biceps tendon. And the treatment as being shown here on the video is to cut the remaining fibers and allow the biceps tendon to slide down the, the tendon sheath. And you can see once you get all these, these fibers cut, you're removing the tension. So here's a dog at two months. This is a dog two months after biceps tendon release. You can see no lameness evident there. Uh, this is a dog six weeks after biceps tendon release. And you can see that these animals quickly recover and are out of pain. Another condition that we see inside the shoulder is shoulder instability. And again, this is something that's very hard to, to diagnose even with MRI or with ultrasound. But with a scope, it becomes quite easy. So you can see the image right here on the top. Um, that image is one that um, shows the normal anatomy. So you can see the subscapularis and we can see the medial glenohumeral ligament. When we look down on the left images, we can see that we have a tear of that subscapularis tendon. And again, this would be very difficult to diagnose with MRI or with CT. On the right, we can see that the medial glenohumeral ligament is torn in both of these patients. Now the medial glenohumeral ligament and the subscapularis both provide medial collateral stability to the shoulder joint. Again, we showed one example of sticking a scope into mini arthrotomies. Um, this, this is an example of, of sticking in, in the shoulder. And again, when we do a caudal approach like this, this is basically a caudal mini arthrotomy. And you can see on the image on the left, what we're doing is, is we're um, going in between 
the, um, the scapular portion and the spinous portion of the triceps or the deltoid muscles to get down in there and get down to the joint. And again, in this arthrotomy, you can obviously see the humeral head. But if you put the scope in, you can direct that scope all the way cranially to see the biceps. You can direct it all the way medially to see the medial glenohumeral ligament. And you can see the entire humeral head. So while if you look at this arthrotomy, the example of the arthrotomy, you can't really see much of anything except the humeral head. By placing the scope directly into your arthrotomy, you get all these um, wonderful views. Let's, let's shift gears and go to the elbow. We use um, arthroscopy in the elbow um, for an assessment of the elbow. We can use it to stage OA. So for instance, in this image here, you can see that there's cartilage on one side of the joint at the top, but you can see ebernated bone on the top um, upper right of that humeral condyle. So we can use it to stage OA and we can use it to help us make decisions. So for instance, if we see a lot of aggressive cartilage loss or cartilage abrasion, that may change the way we treat that patient. We may want to do a, a sliding humeral osteotomy. We may say the whole joint's um, damaged. We need to, a fragment removal is not going to help. We need to go ahead and treat this with elbow replacement. So again, we can use it to assess the joint and then we can use the scope to treat the joint. So if we've got fragmented coronoid process, OCD uh, flaps, we can take our instrument in and we can remove that coronoid process that's fragmented off or we can move, remove the flap. So I like the scope in the elbow to help me decide what to do. So on the radiograph, these patients may all look similar. Okay, so the radiograph is not very sensitive, but once we stick the scope in, we open a new world. So for instance, look at the image on your left where we have a very small fragment. This looks, you know, very, very minor. In fact, you know, sometimes it's even hard to find the fragment. And if you look at all the cartilage around that fragment, everything looks normal and healthy. So we're certainly gonna treat that case differently from these remaining three cases. Let's look at the second case where we have a very large fragment. And now you're starting to see more cartilage wear both at the top on the, on the humeral condyle, as well as on the bottom on that um, medial coronoid process. So again, we can see a lot of um, a big, huge fragment that, that has a big bony component to it as well. And it's displaced and causing a lot of pain and problems. So certainly we definitely need to get this big old fragment out. Let's look at the next um, case here. This next case, you can see that we've lost a lot of cartilage in the medial compartment. So we have bone on bone. The fragment is just a small little fragment. So the main problem is not even the fragment in this case. The main problem is that we just have so much pressure on the medial compartment, it's caused total erosion of the cartilage. So again, I'm gonna treat this case much differently than I'm gonna treat the first two. And lastly, the fourth case, you can see that the uh, medial coronoid process and the radius do not align. There's incongruity. There's a step defect. Again, this will, this will uh, lead us to, do, to treat this a little bit differently to try to improve that congruity. So again, arthroscopy is not only minimally invasive and decreases pain, it improves your ability to, to, to see so we have better decision-making skills. We can see better because of the magnification and the fact that we're looking at that joint in a fluid medium. So all these different modalities you see on the screen here for treating elbow dysplasia, we can employ based on what we see on our arthroscopic image. Let's talk about getting the scope in just the right place in the elbow. So what I like to do is get an egress portal in and put some fluid into the joint. And what I want to do is base my portals on this medial epicondyle, which is illustrated in red. So if I imagine drawing a line from this most prominent um, anatomic structure on the medial side of the joint, the medial epicondyle, if I draw that line straight down the radius, okay, and just kind of, I don't have to actually draw a line, but I just visualize the plane of the radius from this medial epicondyle. My scope portal 
is generally going to be about 45 degrees off of that line. And it'll be right in that location there. And if I calibrate the radiograph, again, I know to, in this particular case, it's going to be 10 millimeters away from that medial epicondyle and 45 degrees off that plane of the radius. So that's where I want to put my scope portal to get the most optimal image. If I put my scope portal there, I can see both up towards the ankyneal process and I can see all the way in front of the radius. What about the instrument portal? Well, generally we're gonna come directly cranial to the scope portal, and we want to end up at the cranial edge of the radius in that location there. So again, if I've calibrated this radiograph, I can measure that distance, and I would anticipate after making my scope portal caudal medial, that I would make my cranial lateral, I mean my cranial medial instrument portal 12 millimeters cranial to that. So again, this helps beginning surgeons, you know, predict where their portals are going to be created. And that will, will lead you to better positioning of your scope and your instrument and give you a better result. So how do we treat these fragments? If we have a, a medial coronoid process that's fragmented off, ideally we would just stick a grasper in and pull it out. And that's what we want to do. We want to remove the fragment. Now, the fragment is only one source of the pain, okay? Again, it may be the least source of the pain. So typically, there's going to be fragments that just haven't broken off yet. So these are called little micro fractures in the medial coronoid process. So we're going to want to go ahead and remove those. Um, this is an example of that. So in this image, you can see a couple fragments just in front of that shaver. Now, sometimes those fragments are tucked up very tight in the joint. And if you try to go in there and remove it with a grasper, you scrape and damage the healthy cartilage on both sides. Now just cranial to these fragments in this location right here, okay? So here's the fragments here. Just cranial to it and medial is very soft bone. And if you look histologically at that bone, there's lots of micro cracks and there's even you know, some bone that's necrotic in that area. So when you palpate it, you can tell that it's not normal bone, it's very soft. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll remove this damaged bone because this microfracture bone is like a stress fracture, it hurts. So we wanna get rid of this damaged bone and get back to nice solid bone. So we can do that with a curette or we can use a motorized shaver, which I prefer. So the motorized shaver is very quick and we can be very precise with it. And you can see it's shielded to keep it from inadvertently causing iatrogenic damage. So once we get back to nice solid bone, you can see we're just kind of finishing it up here. What this does is it gets rid of the, the, the bad bone or the microfracture bone to relieve pain. But in addition, it creates more space so that we can go in and remove our two fragments without causing that iatrogenic damage. So again, we've just about finished treating that bed. We're gonna get that little point off right there. And now you can see our fragments are much more accessible and they're gonna be much easier to remove. So this is why I really like an arthroscopic shaver. You can do so much with it. And again, we all try to avoid spending money that we don't have to, but in my opinion, this thing will last 20 years. And so, you know, get one of these, it'll make your life easier and you will be a better arthroscopist. So this allows us to go in very easily, remove these fragments, and pull them out of the joint very atraumatically. Sometimes you'll have a very dense, hard piece of bone that's, that's sclerotic, and the shaver just bounces off of it. Well, you could use a burr with the shaver, and that would remove that hard bone, but the burr creates a lot of debris and things, and, and you know that's just one way of doing it. Another way to do it is to take a tiny little osteotomian through your instrument portal. In this case here, you can see this two millimeter osteotome is coming in at the fissure. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna just have the assistant tap it and it breaks the piece off right at the cleavage point. Now, sometimes this piece is too big to grab with a, with a grasper and we may have to take that osteotome and break it up into two or three pieces. 
But the goal is, is to get it so it fits nicely into the grasper and we can remove it very quickly as this video showed. So this is a very useful technique. And again, the osteotome has to be very, very small and very sharp. This is a dog after just removing the fragments. And we also did a procedure called a biceps tendon release, which is a procedure that we'll sometimes do to take some of the stress off the medial compartment. So take a look at how non-invasive this procedure is. This is two weeks post-op. So you can see in this case here that that dog had both elbows operated and two weeks after looks basically normal because we didn't have to go in and do a lot of trauma to the joint capsule or soft tissues around the joint. We're going to finish up the foreleg now with carpal arthroscopy. And that's not a traditional joint we scope, but there are some, some indications. So one of the indications is helping you decide if you need a pancarpal arthrodesis or a partial arthrodesis. So for instance, if radiographically you suspect that the injury is at the intercarpal or carpal metacarpal joint, you may not have to do a pancarpal arthrodesis. Now, some people just say pancarpal arthrodesis everything, but I don't like to do that because it does have the chance of higher complications. So if I think I have a case of, of a, a dog that's a, a good candidate for partial arthrodesis, I'll quickly scope the radiocarpal joint just to make sure it looks normal. In this case here, in these two dogs here, we saw chips and damage inside that radiocarpal joint. So we changed our mind and decided to do a pancarpal arthrodesis because now we have evidence that there is damage in the carpal joint. But if that carpal joint had looked normal, we would have done a partial arthrodesis. So this is what those two cases look like. The partial arthrodesis obviously preserves the range of motion of the radiocarpal joint. So hopefully you have a normal functioning joint. Whereas pancarpal arthrodesis, we lose all the function of that joint. Now let's take a look at this case here. Pre-op, you can see that obviously there's collapse of that, radio, of that middle carpal joint. Um, and so this would have been a good candidate to do a partial arthrodesis. But the surgeon in this case, you can see this pre-op stress view, we can see that the problem is not in the radiocarpal joint, it's distal to that. And a, a partial arthrodesis would have been the, the proper choice in my opinion. But in this case, a, a, a pancarpal arthrodesis was done, but unfortunately got infected. So what happened was it got a very serious infection. It was a MRSA and the, and we, and the infection couldn't be controlled with antibiotics alone. The implant had to come out prematurely an attempt was made to bridge it with, a, um, with this external fixator, which is a circular fixator, transarticular fixator, and to put bone graft in it, but it still never healed. And again, this was a case that went to a, a long-term uh, unhealed arthrodesis and was made, maintained with a long-term prosthetic or orthotic, excuse me. So again, this could have been avoided and, and simplified probably with a partial arthrodesis from the start. So we're gonna stop there, we're done with the foreleg. Are there any questions at this point in time before moving to the hind yes. leg? Yes, we definitely have a few questions, Brian. Um, the first one, I'm glad somebody asked because I'm sure more, more people need to know, what is a shaver? Okay, a shaver, again, I apologize for not having enough time to explain everything in depth. But a shaver is just a motorized little tool. Um, basically, it has an assortment of different blades, different cutting edges. And what it does is it spins this cutting edge to cut tissue. And you can get a variety of different types of cutting uh, surfaces. So you can get something that cuts soft tissues, cuts more aggressively bone and cartilage, or you can get a burr that, that will remo remove solid bone. So, a suction hose will hook up to this device so it, it sucks away the debris as you're cutting it. So it's a very useful tool for removing tissue, whether that be soft tissue, cartilage, or bone inside a joint. And the next question is with regard to uh, fluid ingress. Do you flush with saline? Do I need a pressure bag? Okay, so when we're doing arthroscopy, 
we have to have a very good image. To have a good image, you have to have fluids circulating through the joint. So we have an instrument that goes in that delivers fluid into the joint, and that's through the scope. And it's actually through the cannula that the scope sits in. So we hook up a fluid line to that, and we push in fluids either with a arthroscopic pump, or we can use just a regular fluid bag that has a pressure bag around it. So if you just hang a bag, it typically doesn't have enough pressure by gravity to send that fluid into the joint and distend the joint capsule. So we usually want some pressure on it. We can do that with a, 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 a cheap way with a pressure bag, or we can use a, a pressure pump or an arthroscopic pump that delivers it under a certain pressure. And that's obviously gonna be better, but if, if you wanna um, hold off on getting that a little bit later, that's one option. Okay, and last question for right now is, with regard to getting practice, somebody's really eager to get going, uh, I need experience, what joint should I focus on first? I think most people would say that the elbow joint is the easiest to get in and get a good image. And again, um, you know, I tell people that the first few times you try to do arthroscopy in a joint, you might not get everything accomplished. But each time you do it, you'll get further and further along. It's very helpful to go scrub in with someone who does arthroscopy. And certainly everybody on this seminar is welcome to come visit me. Um, we'd be happy to have you in the OR with us and learn all the tips and tricks. But again, I think the, the elbow is the, the easiest joint to learn. Um, the stifle should be easy, but people tend to struggle most, mostly with the stifle. So I'd probably say most people find shoulder e uh, elbow easiest, shoulder second, and stifle third. Okay, uh, I think that's it for now, right? All right, well, let's move on to the, the back of the, uh, of the dog, and we're gonna look at the hind limb. And a lot of people don't think about hip arthroscopy. And there's not a lot of indications from it, but hip arthroscopy actually is very easy to do. It's very simple, very quick, very easy to get into the joint. I primarily use hip arthroscopy now as a tool to assess dogs whether they're gonna be an acceptable patient for DPO or double pelvic osteotomy. So I'm doing this in juvenile dogs. I also will do it in some dogs that have, have had hip dislocation to assess the cartilage uh, before I actually go into the joint. And again, I have used it to assist me in placing a prosthetic round ligament as well, or a toggle ligament. So we know if you look at a radiograph, it's fairly unreliable. So there was a study that was, um, that was put out in the early 2000s that looked at dogs that radiographically scored normal in their hips, but these were juvenile dogs and they had a positive Ortolani sign. Well, in this study, we compared the radiographs that had a score of zero, meaning a normal hip as read by a radiologist, to their arthroscopic score. And we saw that many of these dogs that had a, a, a normal hip read out on, on radiographs had extensive changes within the joint. So what that tells us is arthroscopy is a much more sensitive indicator of the environment within the joint. So I use arthroscopy in any dog that I'm going to do a DPO on. So if I stick the scope in the joint and the labrum looks like that on the left, it looks normal, which is that structure number two, that's a good candidate for DPO. However, if I see extensive wear to that labrum as on the right, this would be a dog that I would say is in the gray zone or not a candidate for DPO. And even more important is the cartilage surface. We all know that if a dog has OA or osteoarthritis, radiographic arthritis, that's a contraindication to doing a double pelvic osteotomy. But again, we just saw a study where a lot of those dogs had a normal um, radiograph, but if we stick the scope in and we see this, this cartilage wear, I would consider this a contraindication to doing the procedure. Even though the radiograph looks good, the cartilage has wear and that by definition is osteoarthritis. So I would change and not do a DPO in that particular patient. And this may explain why some dogs with DPO previously did not have a good outcome. 
they were just not a good candidate for DPO because they already probably had cartilage wear. So here's a particular case where I used a scope in this dog that obviously has severe subluxation of the hips. Now this dog was a 12 month old dog. So classically that might be out of the range where you might consider a DPO. But when we stuck the scope in the joint, the labrum was good, the cartilage looked good. So even though it wasn't necessarily in that age bracket of six to nine months that we typically do DPO, we felt because that there was no arthritis on the x-ray and the arthroscopic uh, structures looked good, that this was worth the risk. And this dog, two, two years post-op, you can see these hips still look pretty darn good. And this dog clinically is doing very, very well. So instead of going with a, a, an FHO or a total hip, a DPO was a good solution for this particular dog. Let's move on to the stifle. So by far, one of the biggest benefits of using arthroscopy is with the stifle. And every dog who has a hind limb lameness is a cruciate tear until proven otherwise. It's that common. I don't know how, how many dogs with hind limb lameness actually have cruciate, but I bet you it's about 90%. So cruciate tears are so common. And a lot of times, you know, you may not be able to detect it on your physical exam, because it's a partial tear. So stifle arthroscopy will help us diagnose whether we have a complete or a partial tear of the cruciate. It'll help us with meniscal tears. It will be valuable with medial patellar luxation. A lot of dogs with medial patellar luxation also have a cruciate tear. So you might miss it if you went in with the arthrotomy and just focus on the patella, but it becomes very evident with that magnification that that cruciate's not normal. So you might wanna treat both at the same time. We can also use it to treat OCD, to treat septic arthritis of the stifle, and as well, we can use it to assist us in repairing intraarticular fractures. The major benefits of stifle arthroscopy are treating meniscal tears and documenting and diagnosing partial cruciate tears. So again, if we look at this image, the top image, this is a dog that had a bucket handle tear. And look at those two tiny incisions that allowed us to treat and remove that large bucket handle tear. So obviously, this is much preferred to a, a large arthrotomy to take that damaged piece of cartilage out. So this is one of the major benefits of arthroscopy over arthrotomy. Now as well, look at these two images of partial cranial cruciate ligament tears. And I can tell you, these images are magnified 20% or, or 200%. And you can, or even more than that, actually, this is probably magnified about 20 times, I mean. So if you look at the insertion of this cranial cruciate ligament, you can see that that is starting to tear away from its attachment to the tibial plateau. And on the image on your right, you can see the origin of this cranial cruciate ligament is starting to tear. Now you wouldn't even see that with your naked eye because we've actually taken the scope back to the back of the ligament and we're using that light cable to look behind the ligament and see this tear. So if you went in surgically, you might think, ah, oh, this is a normal cruciate ligament, when in fact, it's just an early partial tear. So the scope is highly um, useful in these stifle injuries. And not only can you see it, you can document it. What about the portals and the stifle? Like all joints that we're scoping, we typically have three portals. Now the egress portal is located very, or very proximal and on the medial side of the joint. The scope portal is placed on the lateral side of the joint, but down by the patellar tendon. And the instrument portal is about the same level as the scope portal, but on the medial side of the joint. Now the instrument and scope portal are generally placed about the mid portion of the patellar tendon. Okay, so you can see that on this diagram, they're sitting right about in the middle of that patellar tendon. This is what it looks like in a clinical case. And we've kind of outlined the joint um, uh, in, in this marker on top of the skin. So you can see that we're, we're going in at the mid level of the patellar tendon, 
the scope portal is going laterally. And so it's just immediately lateral to that patellar tendon. So you don't want to damage the patellar tendon, but you want to get just next to it. The same thing with that instrument portal. You can see we've made a little stab incision and the shaver blade is being inserted into that instrument portal. And we can visualize that shaver blade with our scope. Now at the top of the um, image or, or the top of the photo, you can see a cannula going in up near the medial aspect of that patella. And that is our egress cannula. So in the case of the stifle, we have a cannula that goes in that allows fluid to egress. So on this image, you can see a fluid line coming in on our scope cannula. So it's delivering the fluid into the, in alongside of the scope. The fluid circulates to the joint and will flush out blood and any debris, and it will exit the joint through that egress cannula. The shaver is being used to remove some fat and synovium just in front of the cruciate ligaments. So we don't need to remove the entire fat pad um, we don't need to remove a huge amount of synovium. The more of that tissue you remove, the more bleeding you're going to get, and it's going to make, it's going to obscure your, your view. So what you want to do is get your shaver tip right in front of those cruciate ligaments at the top of the intercondylar notch. And then you want to just remove a little bit of synovium and fat right in front of those ligaments to give you the view that you see in, in figure C. So once you can see these ligaments, stop your shaving. If you continue, you're just gonna get more ble bleeding and create problems. So we can use our scope to assess the cruciate ligament. In this case here on the left, you can see a complete cruciate tear. So you can see we've labeled both ends of the cruciate ligament, and you can see that there's no intact cruciate ligament remaining. The LC represents the lateral condyle because that's where the cruciate ligament originates. Now, on this image on the right we went in, there's no cruciate ligament. So it used to look like the image on the left, but the body naturally will absorb these torn collagen fibers. And you may go in if it's a chronic case and not see any cruciate at all to debride. This is a very early tear. So you can see the caudal cruciate on your right, the cranial cruciate on your left, and you can see that at the insertion of that cranial cruciate on the lateral side, some torn fibers, or on the medial side, excuse me. So this is a cranial medial band tear of the cruciate ligament. Now the remaining fibers are still intact and very functional. So in this case here, we would typically debride some of the, the obviously torn fibers very quickly and then we would perform a TPLO on this dog to take stress off the remaining fibers. And we've shown that you can actually save the functional fibers in this manner. Here's another partial tear of the cruciate. Now this is a little bit later partial tear. So you can see it looks a little funny and when you palpate it, it no longer is taut. It's very, very loose. So in this case here, this is a non-functional partial tear or a late unstable partial tear. We would remove these fibers. There's no sense in leaving those in place. They're not going to tighten up. They're not going to provide stability. All they may do is provide lasting pain. So remove those fibers in that case. Meniscal exam is very important and this is where you can really help yourself with your outcome with your cruciate cases there's a ton of meniscal tears that are missed. These are called latent tears. And what you need to do to improve your diagnosis is have a scope to magnify the meniscus. Look at this meniscus here. It's so huge and so clear, you can see it very clearly. And this dog is actually a, a cadaver dog. So you can see the full meniscus even though the cranial cruciate is completely intact. So the other thing that's been shown in Antonio Pazzi's done a lot of work with the meniscus in the dog and a really interesting study it was in vet surgery 2008 where he showed if you probe that caudal horn of the medial meniscus you will increase your ability to diagnose meniscal tears two times with arthrotomy and three times with arthroscopy. 
Okay, so what that means is it's important to probe that caudal horn of the meniscus in any dog that has a cruciate tear to diagnose these latent tears. Here's an example of a type of tear called a radial tear where the edge of the meniscus is just frayed. Now, certainly treating that with the shaver to remove that, that, that frayed edge may be beneficial, but this is considered to be less clinical than a bucket handle tear. So in this case here, look at the image on your left. You can see what appears to be a normal meniscus. But when we bring that probe in and probe this, and this is actually a Cairn Terrier. This dog probably weighs eight, seven, eight kilograms. So it's a small dog. But look how big that meniscus looks, even in this small dog. And when we probe it, you can actually reach back, find a small hole or rent in the meniscus, and we can pull it forward. And in this position, we can do a partial meniscectomy. So the image on the right is after we remove that bucket handle tear, and we always want to do a partial meniscectomy and leave the residual functional meniscus in place. Here's a little video from um, one of my um, partners at Gulf Coast Veterinary Specialists where we're actually probing this latent tear. This is a case by Wayne Whitney. It's just a really nice video showing identifying the tear that you couldn't see, grasping it, and, and cutting the two attachments, the two bucket handles. We're cutting the abaxial attachment first, followed by the axial attachment second, to complete the partial meniscectomy in a very um, accurate and precise manner. And you can see we haven't created any more trauma to the cartilage surfaces. So what did we actually do? So this little shaded area in the caudal horn of the meniscus represents a bucket handle tear. So this is known as the abaxial attachment. And the, the axial attachment, which is more near the center of the joint, is shown here with the second arrow. So what we want to do is do a partial meniscectomy. So how do we do that? Well, there's multiple ways to do it, but my two favorite ways are as follows. So this is technique number one. So I've identified the bucket handle tear in green. And what I want to do is cut the abaxial attachment, which is in white, first. So I like to cut the abaxial attachment first because if I cut that one first, I can see the axial attachment better. If I cut the axial attachment first, sometimes it makes it difficult to see the abaxial attachment. Some surgeons do it just the opposite, but this works best for me. So I'm gonna come in with a meniscal knife or a slender punch or a thermal probe. I'm gonna just cut that little white line, which is the abaxial attachment. I tend to use either a meniscal knife or a slender punch to, to cut that, that um, first attachment. After I've cut the first attachment, I'm gonna grasp the meniscus and apply a little traction. And then I'm gonna go in and cut the axial attachment, which is that other little white line. And so I can do this again with a slender punch. I can do it with a meniscal knife. After I remove that bucket handle tear, I'm going to reprobe. I want to look for evidence of a second bucket handle tear. We do see this. I see this every month, at least one double bucket handle tear. So after you remove the first piece, don't forget to go back and check to see if there's another piece to remove. Okay. We can smooth the edge of it or sculpt the edge of it if necessary with a little cautery unit. Now here's the second way to do it. So again, we're gonna cut the abaxial attachment first with a slender punch, but instead of grasping it and cutting the other attachment, another way to do it is to shave it. So we can bring a shaver in and we can just shave that meniscus away back to the axial attachment. So that's another nice way to do it. And then we can follow that up with, with uh, kind of shaping or sculpting the edge with the cautery if needed. So the disadvantage of this technique is it might take a little bit longer time. And sometimes if that meniscus is very hard or tough or your shaver blade is, is, is not sharp, it may not cut effectively. If you are to having trouble seeing the meniscus because you've got a tight joint, you can use this articulated lever. And what you do is you actually make a second stab incision 
just proximal to your scope portal on the lateral side, and you slide this into the intracondylar area, and you attach that tip to the caudal aspect of the joint on the back edge of the tibial plateau. So you've commonly done this with an arthrotomy. You can do it with arthroscopy, and you simply lever this up against the femoral condyle to give you better visualization. If your joint is really tight and you don't have an assisted, this stifle distractor is very, very effective. So this is a, a, a very quick thing that you can put two pins, one in the top of the tibia, one in the bottom of the femur. You slide this device on and you start to turn the turnbuckle and it pulls the femoral condyle away from the tibial plateau, creating much more space and it holds it very still so you can get your instruments in to treat this meniscal tear. So I highly recommend this device. It is something that you may only use once a month or once every two months, but when you need it, you'll be thankful you had it because it makes partial meniscectomy much easier and you're much less likely to cause iatrogenic damage to the tibial's cartilage or the femoral cartilage. Lastly, we already talked about arthroscopic assisted arthrotomy. If things aren't going well, just extend your, your scope portal and put your scope into the joint. And you can put your instrument right in there too and do the same thing you would do with traditional arthroscopy. You can see in this case here, arthroscopy makes TPLOs very minimally invasive. So this is what my typical TPLO looks like. Just enough room to get my saw blade in you can see our scope portal above is where we did all the intra-articular um, work. And if you can do arthroscopies like this, we're gonna to tend to see the dogs use the, the leg very well after surgery. This is typically what they look like one day post-op. Uh, this is one dog um, getting ready to go home. This is another dog one day post-op. So again, because we haven't disrupted the joint capsule and a lot of the soft tissue, these dogs are much more comfortable. Lastly, we can use the scope for OCD. Again, um, it magnifies things. You can just see a lot better. You can see the flaps. You can go in and grab them. Um, again, because you're running a lot of fluids through it, it flushes the blood out of the joint. So again, you can oftentimes see more than one flap. In this case here, this is a second flap after removing the main flap that was in there that you might not see with arthrotomy. So it allows you to remove flaps that you know, maybe in, in, in areas that are difficult to, to get to. It also helps you to bride the subchondral bone. So this is showing a curette, and that flap is dissecting all the way up underneath the tibia. And so the magnification allows you to see that there's additional damage that, it, that extends past the original flap. So we can go in and remove it with a curette, or we can go with our shaver again and you, you can see we can slide that shaver up that's shielded so it protects the cartilage and we can turn that on and it starts to cut the damaged bone and cartilage away and suck it up in the lumen and remove it from the joint. The final thing I use arthroscopy for is to help me determine how I want to treat this dog after surgery. An example of this is cranial cruciate ligament tears. If you look at the literature, all the long-term studies show that there is some progression of osteoarthritis as time goes on. So I use my scope to assess you know, these dogs and, and really look at how much damage is there. Is there a lot of osteophytes? Is there cartilage wear? Is there mild synovitis? Is there severe synovitis? And this is gonna impact me as to how long I treat them postoperatively with non anti-inflammatory drugs, whether I put hyaluronic acid in, whether I put PRP in, whether I treat them with a fatty acid supplement for the entire life of the dog to suppress this longstanding synovitis. So again, you just get a much better appreciation for the intra-articular environment to help you with your long-term management of that patient. So in summary, arthroscopy is the gold standard for treating joint disease in the dog. Um, if you're not doing it now, I'd encourage you to take a course and start doing it you'll appreciate things much better once you see that magnified view. It's low morbidity, dogs recur, uh, improve and recover more quickly. 
it gives you a more accurate diagnosis and greater surgical precision. So I'll stop there and then thank you for your time. Be happy to answer any more questions. Okay, thank you, Brian. I have some questions here. Um, first one, for a partial cranial cruciate ligament tear, what are your criteria for excising remnants? I've seen some surgeons leave it in place with the thought that it provides some rotational stability, but others will always remove the remnants regardless of how partial the tear is due to suspicion that free exposed edges will continue to contribute to inflammation. So as we saw in, in this, this presentation, those, those torn components resorb and they usually resorb fairly quickly within about two or three months. Um, I've never been able to find an article when I've searched the databases that show that those torn fibers actually promote um, arthritis or synovitis. Um, what has been shown in multiple studies is that if those fibers are functional and you perform a TPLO or a CBLO, that you can save those fibers. And then they will provide not only rotational stability, but more important than that, they will help prevent future meniscal tears. So if you take the whole ligament out, you're going to have a joint, even with TPLO or CBLO, that has, um, it has dynamic stability, but it does not have static stability. So you still get cranial drawer, and we will see a much higher likelihood of meniscal tear. So if you're doing extra capsule or TTA, I'm okay with removing all those residual fibers because they don't provide enough protection to save those functional fibers. If you're doing TPLO or CBLO, look at the literature, look at the evidence, and you'll see based on second look arthroscopy that you can save the remaining cruciate ligament in 95% of those cases. Okay, can you speak in general to the post-op management of arthroscopy patients? So in general, post-operative post management is pretty simple. We're just going to talk in general terms. We're really not talking about the surgical procedure, say the TPLO or whatever. But if you just scope the joint, generally these dogs, sometimes I'll scope four joints at the, at the same time. And these dogs will go running out of the, the clinic the same day. So I think in general, whenever you stick a scope in the joint, you are going to get some inflammation. So we want to decrease activity, you know, for at least a couple of weeks after surgery, because we want to allow that joint to quiet down. Um, you know, as far as what do we do for the first day or two, certainly putting a little ice on it, um, maybe four or five times a day for 15 minutes can be advantageous. Will the dog do okay without it? Yeah, it'll probably do okay. But by putting the ice on, you'll suppress the inflammation more and you'll make that patient more comfortable. As far as the portals go, we usually close those with one or two subcuticular sutures. And then we'll usually put some sort of a small adhesive bandage over top of the portals just to help prevent ascending infection. If you do get some leakage of fluid afterwards, you may need to, to put a soft padded absorbent bandage on it for one or two days. Typically, we don't do that. If we just get a little bit of, of fluid kind of seeping out, we'll just have the owners kind of clean that in a very aseptic fashion. I do recommend putting e-collars on at least for four or five days, even if it's totally arthroscopic, because I don't want that dog licking that, that incision and creating an ascending infection. Okay, and now the million dollar question, for whom? Does it make sense financially to get into arthroscopy? Will the revenue generated cover the cost of all this expensive equipment? <laughs> okay, that's a great question. And, and everybody's always concerned about return on investment. And again, I anticipated that someone might ask this question and I was going to push it to the end. But, um, you know, in my clinic, I actually did assess that. And what I did was I kind of looked at it, should I buy new or used? And originally, I did start out with used many, many moons ago, and it was very frustrating. I would really advise that you buy a new system. And again, it's all about the quality image. Uh, when you buy a new system, 
everything works. It's all compatible. You get someone who knows what they're doing to come help you set it up and optimize the image. So that support is critical and they will help you with training. Um, this will shorten your learning curve. You know, the quicker startup, you know, is going to save you money. It's going to make you money and piecemealing leads to problems. So again, it's already hard enough to learn arthroscopy to begin with. So don't make it harder by, by getting bad equipment. So will it pay for itself? That was the question. So, um, in year one, when I started um, many years ago, um, I bought a very, very nice HD system with all the instruments and it cost me $70,000. And I was already doing a lot of advanced surgery and I bought two scopes. Originally I bought a 1.9 and a 2.7 scope. Now, again, if you already have a camera and light source, maybe you're doing laparos laparoscopy or you're doing endoscopy, um, you know, well, if you're doing laparoscopy, you might have the camera and light source already. But if you do, then you, you, it may not cost you as much. But let's say you don't, and it costs you 70 grand. Um, if you want to skip the pump, back then the pump was less expensive as it is now because this was many years ago, but you could su subtract that off. I recommend you get a pump, but if you have to leave anything off at the beginning, you know, I'd rather you get a shaver than a pump. So the first year um, I had that, you know, I, I made about $40,000. So I, I was charging very little. I was just training myself. And so again, $40,000 doesn't pay the equipment off, but I used it in multiple different cases. I use it in the nose, the ear, and a little bit in the bladder, but mainly the, the joint. Um, so la the first year, you know, technically I lost a little money, but I provided a good service. Um, the year two, however, I had a profit. And the year three, this profit just kept going up. So this was back when, you know, my caseload was quite low. Um, so again, you can see that if you have a much higher caseload, and so at, at Gulf Coast Veterinary Specialists, um, we were doing about 900 TPLOs a year. At Gulf Coast Veterinary Specialists, we were charging an extra 500 for arthroscopy. So very quickly, um, you can see that adding that $500 extra on for arthroscopy made, made this pay for itself very quickly. And, and we still offered arthrotomy. Basically, we said, we'll do it arthroscopically and it'll be $500. Here's the advantages to it. Decreased morbidity, we can get a better diagnosis, we can be more precise, or we can do it the other way with arthrotomy. 98% of the people chose arthroscopy, even though it was $500 more. So our profit year one was actually $380,000. So it very quickly paid for, its, for, for the equipment. So again, it depends a little bit on you able to generate the cases, but you know, this is just one example. So if you have a heavy caseload you know, and, and you introduce arthroscopy, it's going to be profitable. But the one profit center that you might not think about is now people refer to you instead of your competitor. So you're offering minimally invasive doing TPLOs, small incisions, more rapid recovery. You're also gonna get that TPLO case that you might not have gotten that might've gone down to your neighbor. And so that doesn't even really show up on the line item for arthroscopy. So anyway, can arthroscopy um, you know, pay for itself? It, it pays for itself very quickly if you use it. So I think we're out of time. Aren't we? Or we have any more I think questions? We are, Brian. Thank you very much for an excellent overview of a very large topic. Hopefully, we can get you back one day to do something more advanced. Um, well, once again, I sorry. I, I I would just leave by saying thank you very much for this opportunity. I love to share this knowledge, and I would encourage everybody to take as many arthroscopic labs as they can, even if you've already taken one. Repeat it, and you'll get better and better as time goes on. Absolutely. Once again, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us. And I have a strange question. Has anyone ever contemplated laparoscopic surgery in the largest of land animals, say over 10,000 pounds, like a rhino or an elephant?
<laughs> Next week, we'll have the opportunity to hear a fascinating story about advances in laparoscopic techniques and instrumentation that support elephant conservation and research in South Africa. Dr. Mark Stetter, who is the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Colorado State University, and also the founding director of the Elephant Population Management Program will present this story and answer your questions. Next Wednesday, September 9th at 2 p.m. New York time. So even if you're not planning to scope any elephants in the near future, I think you might find this presentation quite interesting. Uh, remember any previous talks you'd like to see are available to view free online at Endoscopy Talks. And I'd like to wish you all well in your practice and of course the best of health during these challenging times. We look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. <laughs>